tales for dark nights. Knuckle Supper Written by Drew Stepick Performed here by Jason Hill Chapter 6 Thespians Bate pulled a shot of her blood out of her backpack. Here, she said, handing me a container. A SpongeBob sippy cup. Sorry, the only way I could figure out how to get it here without dumping it everywhere in my backpack. Reluctantly, I took the shot. Okay, Bate, I said, tapping the brass werewolf knocker against the heavily weathered black wood door. This guy is a little weird. I gripped tightly to the heavy duffel bag filled with smack. Weird how? She wiped her nose on her sleeve, dragging the front of her hair out of her face as she pulled her arm away. How much weirder can he be than the rest of the losers you've introduced me to? She blew at the strand of hair in an attempt to get it to return to the rest of her messy mop. I had no right to say anyone was unkempt, but yeah, Bate was pretty much a pig. Just be quiet until he gets the chance to pick up your scent. I'm sure he'll like you. Hmm. As far as people like us go, he's very tame. Okay, what's his name? She crossed her eyes. The lock of hair was now sticking straight out from her face. She blew more profusely, but since the hard-boiled hair hunk refused to comply, and because it somehow managed to mix with snot, it just shot further and further up like a unicorn's horn. I licked my hand. God damn it, bait. Not wanting to touch her, I quickly pushed the hair down and back into place as best I could. His name is Eldritch. Would you stop being such a... She bucked out her teeth and shook her head. Twelve, you old? Yeah. Yeah, you talk about how street you are, but you act like... Before I could finish my lecture on booger wiping in public, the large door crept open on its own to reveal an oversized, and overpriced, high ceiling loft. The main room was only lit by a few candles. Without missing a beat, Bate bravely stepped in and looked behind the door to see who had opened it. I thought he knew we were coming. She turned back and surveyed the room that was decorated with bad vampire movie cliches. Oh, he knows we're coming, all right. I sighed. She stepped in a little further, cupped her hands around her mouth, and shouted, Hello! Her voice, combined with lame goth music, echoed and bounced off the cathedral ceilings. I put my hand over my mouth. Shut up! Go sit over there! I pointed across the room to an area of red Victorian couches. Frustrated, she stomped across the hardwood floor of the loft to the couches like a brat whose mother wouldn't buy her a pack of gummy bears while waiting in line at the supermarket. Being the megalomaniac that he was, Eldritch had his acting sizzle reel playing on several TVs that were framed and set up like magic mirrors around the room. The reel was synced on all the TVs. It pathetically showed him acting in bit parts, intermixed with him playing with swords, shooting fireballs from his eyes, and, vigilantly, overlooking Los Angeles from the tops of old, gothic buildings. Feeling a migraine developing, I massaged my temples as I walked over to the spiral marble staircase leading to the master's suite. Eldritch! I called up the stairs. It's RJ! I looked back at Bate, who, in the ten seconds that I wasn't scolding her, had managed to make her way across the room to a large structure that was covered by an embroidered scarlet velvet drape. She bent over and lifted the drape in a half-assed attempt to see what was hidden underneath. I clapped my hands and hissed, Get back on the couch! Startled, she dropped the drape and returned to her upright position. Shooting knives at me with her stare, she mouthed, What? I pointed back to the couch, this time snapping my fingers to show authority. She decided to give me the finger. How this little shit wasn't killed by a pimp or a john was mind-numbing. Just then, the music in the room intensified at the crescendo before the chorus. Hundreds of candles flared up around the room, 
Startled by a living human shrine that lit up last in the corner, Bates scurried back to the couch and sat up straight. Knowing the curtain had been lifted and the show was about to begin, I followed her lead and plopped myself onto the couch next to her. She pointed to the lethargic body in the corner. What is that? She whispered. Just shut up and watch. Incense and smoke, I guess originating from a fan blowing a dry ice machine, materialized from an open doorway at the top of the stairs. Growing shadow broadcasting from a red light bulb engulfed the room as Eldritch's white, high cheekbone face appeared from what he must have figured was the beyond. The pulsating sound of a vox organ followed his steps as he seemingly floated from the perched room. I tried to close my eyes so their blatant rolling at the spectacle would go largely unnoticed. Train wreck. Half-assed. Overdramatic. None of those words properly described Eldritch. Eldritch stood about six foot six. Not the biggest guy I'd ever seen, but big enough. Still hovering, he floated down the winding stairs, candles to his left and right illuminating as he passed them. His medieval metal fingernails clamped onto each of his digits, including his thumbs, brushed the faux antiqued handrails of the staircase reflecting small rays of light that were being projected out of motion-controlled tracked lasers. I looked down at Bate to get a feel for how she was accepting the production. She rubbed her eyes, probably trying to get the overpowering density of patchouli and the sting of street urchin incense out, and looked up at me. He's hot, she whispered. Eldritch continued his descent into the living room. Over his shoulders was a coat made from a white wolf that puffed up so that the eyes of the dead animal covered his own. The only thing not covered on his face was his jaw and carved chin line. Almost in tempo with the music, he smirked, dragging his tongue across his metallic fangs. The front of the fur opened to reveal every bony protrusion and muscle on his lanky but carved torso and waist. Just below his hip bones, he wore a pair of skin-tight leather pants that looked aged enough to be an auction item from Jim Morrison's estate, but I figured they came from the Jim Morrison collection at an Armani exchange. As the rest of his body came out of the smoke, a pair of bondage-strap creepers finished off his ensemble that could only be described as counterfeit at best. He walked over to us, withdrawing the wolf's head from his face. His long, ebony hair swirled around him and fell perfectly down to the middle of his back. "'Greetings, my friend,' his bottomless voice boomed. I stood up as he reached us, kicking bait to do the same. She seemed to be under a spell, fixated on his greasy pecs. While she ascended slowly, her head barely reached Eldritch's abdomen. He moved toward me for an embrace— Derailing him before he got too close to my personal space, I put up my hand to shake. Dumbfounded, but used to the treatment, Eldritch grabbed my hand. Rather than bringing me in for a full European-style reception, he settled for the less touchy, chest-to-chest bump. I didn't find it too disrespectful. After all, I just sat through a spectacle that combined the resurrection of Christ with the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I'm sure the vampy teens that aligned themselves in Eldritch's Legion, the Nightcrawlers, thought it was pretty awesome. I knew better. I was there at least once a month, and this was the first time I'd ever seen that particular production. Eldritch turned his attention to Bate, who was still enchanted by his theatrics. And this must be the young damsel you spoke of. With one clawed hand, he lifted her chin, and with his other hand, he brought her downturned hand upward. He bent over and kissed it. Controlling her like a marionette, he brushed her hand down his makeup-emphasized cheekbone and pulled her close. Lifting her so her ear was close to his mouth, he whispered, Are you the trick? Well, the treat. Bates' eyes rolled back and her mouth panted. Jesus, come on! I grabbed Bates' arm and dragged her close to me. What the fuck, dude? I yelled, trying to stabilize Bates as she stumbled back to her feet. She's got fucking snot in her hair. 
Why are you so mean? She shrieked, pulling from my grip. I'm pretty, RJ. She kicked her foot up and back and pulled off her horseshoe. Then she started thumping away at my crotch with it. Joke was on her. I invested in a cop immediately after I told her she could move in. As if I needed Eldridge's help to fend off a hundred pound when soaking wet little girl, he heroically came to my rescue by tranquilly placing his hand on her shoulder, his signature spellbinder. He lit a clove cigarette that materialized out of nowhere in his mouth. It is nothing to fight about, young temptress. Sir RJ is simply marking his territory. Bate calmed and returned the shoe to her foot. I rolled my head back and closed my eyes. The combination of smoke, red lights, incense, and overall gayness were making my head throb more. I exhaled as much of the bullshit in the room as I could and bounced my head back into position. First, I looked down at Bate. Calm the fuck down, please. I'm sorry that I don't get excited when a grown man makes sexy talk with a little girl. Then I proceeded to Eldritch, towered over me. As for you, can we get down to business here? This isn't a casting call for your next wannabe victim, dude. Eldritch stood his ground, snarling with his steel fangs. Not really wanting to have the guy rip me in half, I turned away from his stare and looked down at Bate. In an attempt to look threatening, she snarled as she pawed at me. She looked more like a kitten, batting at a moth than any creature from the streets of Los Angeles. I laid the duffel bag on the elaborate coffee table that separated us. Can you take this from me or would you rather have no part in this? Eldritch extended his long arm to the handles and placed the bag on his lap. Using the end of one of his talons, he unzipped the bag, revealing the contents. He looked up at me and smirked. Coke? Have a sample. He split one of the ten-pound bags open, slit some blood out of his finger and let it drip into his claw. He then scooped out a dollop and raised it to his nose for a sniff. He set his head back slightly and clinched the opposite nostril and sucked it into his throat. He waited a minute, then shook his head. Heroin? You say this came from Blue Blood Perry's? Uh, kind of. What are you wearing? Bate interrupted as she petted Eldritch's fur cloak, still on his shoulders. He turned away from our adult conversation and rebooted his charade. It is the pelt of the Arctic Wolf. I was raised by this victim's enemy pack in the northernmost mountains of Canada. I took his hide as a trophy when we took his pack's den. He brought the pelt in around his shoulders as if the phony flashback was traumatizing. It was during the coldest of Arctic winters. They curled her feet under her and her eyes lit up. You were raised by wolves? Some say I'm part lichen, he boasted. No one has ever said that, Eldritch. Ever. Bate put her finger to her lips and faintly shushed me. She stroked the fake pelt and sang out the word. Lichen. I didn't have the heart to take away her excitement. Truth be told, Eldritch was born and raised in a cabin outside of Duluth. He moved to L.A. to become an actor. Unfortunately for him, he was so terrified of the light that he could never make it to any auditions other than the few Z-grade monster movies and standard cable shitfests I saw in his dumb sizzle reel when we walked in. Fate, can you give us a few minutes, please? This is somewhat important, I said. Eldritch returned his attention to me. Okay, RJ, what does kind of mean? Well... You know I kind of owe King Cobra for the habit burning down his place and all? Yes. I flicked at my thumb. Well, Des and I were kind of told by the snakes to kill this BBP dude and the two cops he was snitching to. 
Eldritch threw the bag back on the table, creating a small poof of heroin that drifted through the air like a light snowstorm. He crossed his legs tightly, placed his elbow on his knee and his face in his hand. He scratched at his right cheekbone with his index claw, smearing some of his makeup. So, I assume this pillaged bag of heroin was supposed to go to the battle snakes after you disposed of the snitch? Are you telling me that you and your comrade Dez have decided to stiff them? Have you gone mad, man? It's not what you think, Eldritch, I assured him as I attempted to catch some of the smack floating around the air on my tongue. They have no idea this BBP jackass was asking for heroin from the pigs instead of coke. Here is a question, RJ. Why would a BBP be getting so much? He retreated from his relaxed listening position and opened the bag again and counted. One, two, three. He looked back at me. A dreamy-eyed bait continued to pet Eldridge's pelt. It's fifty, she said. Fifty pounds. Eldridge shook his head and pointed his index claw at me. Why would the BBPs or the Battlesnakes want fifty pounds of heroin? Have you even begun to think about that? They have no use for it. What happened to the rest of it? Did the Knucklers have a party I wasn't invited to? Well, we've been dealing it in Culver City. As far as why it isn't coke, I figured maybe it was a mistake. Maybe that's all the cops could swipe from the evidence room. Eldred searched his thoughts. Or maybe the Battlesnakes are thinking about getting into the heroin business and disposing of the Knucklers altogether. What is their take from the Knucklers dealing? I counted on my fingers. I, I don't know, 50, 60%? Well, seeing as how you have such an outstanding relationship with King Cobra, you know, the burning of his home and friends and all, I think it is safe to say that the Knucklers have seen their last hurrah on the streets of Los Angeles. Why don't they just bring that 40 or 50 percent in-house? You have been set up, RJ. How do you see it? I lugged the duffel bag off the table. We have the drugs. Besides, there's a code of conduct on the streets. We all live somewhat in harmony. Right? Bate interrupted again. I knew there was a vampire law. Shut up, Bate. Go fuck off somewhere. Bate propelled herself from Eldridge's side. Hmm. She started looking around the room filled with romantic oil paintings and Baroque frames and religious statues that he splattered with blood or red paint. I couldn't really tell which, but I bet it was paint. Eldridge closed his eyes and got to his feet. Foolish. They wanted you to steal the drugs. That way, the Battlesnakes have a reason to kill all of you without having them look like they've broken any rules. He began walking towards his shrine in the corner and looked back. Besides, you and I both know there are no rules. Sitting in the corner on a throne-tight chair that matched the rest of the decor in the room was a young man with his eyes rolled back. The figure's lips quivered every so often, but it was clear that he was in a comatose state. Drool dripped from his lips down to his chest and connected with one of the many flexible snake pipes that were plugged into all his major veins. Hooked to his arm was an IV drip of opium. Eldritch knelt in front of his semi-living victim and lit a water-filled sphere embedded in the chest cavity. As he heated up the blood and opium, he placed one of the hoses in his mouth, flipping a valve that was placed halfway down the pipe. He sucked, and smoke manifested from the corners of his lips. He smiled, sucked the toxin into his lungs, waited a second, and then puffed smoke rings straight into the air. Bate made her way over to the coma victim. She waved her hands in front of his eyes and mushed his mouth around with her thumb. Is this guy alive? She finally asked. Ignoring her, Eldritch looked back to me. You genuinely want me to hide these drunks that you have taken from the most dangerous gang in Los Angeles? I regretfully decline, RJ. What? I threw my arms up in frustration. Don't be such a pussy, Eldritch. I like pussy, he said. 
extending his tongue out between his fingers. I am what I eat. He winked at Bate. Bate's right leg sprung up behind her and she began to blush. She's twelve, Molestro. I yelled across the room as I stood up and started walking over to them. I grabbed the pipe out of Eldritch's hand and toked away. The taste was putrid, almost as if he'd filtered the opium-filled blood with perfume before it entered the bowl. Please do this for me. I let out with a hookah load and blew it in his face. Eldritch grabbed the hose back from me and took a quick hit. Because I call you friend, he said. We will decide on this matter like men. He inhaled the smoke. Bates' hand nodded the comatose victim's head around like a bobblehead toy and excitedly said, A fight! Oh, you're so dead, RJ. Eldritch dropped the hose and blew out his last drag. He ethereally clamped onto Bates' wrist to settle her down. It is actually more of a duel than a fight, young one. He dropped her arm to her side. It is the duel of gentlemen. Her eyes widened as she followed him across the room, only to look back at me and stick her tongue out. She clinched on to a piece of Eldritch's wolf coat thing like he had her on a leash. Do you fight with swords or axes or something? She pointed to one of the monitors showing his sizzle reel. Can I use that big sword? Eldritch arrived at the red cloth covered object in the room. Bate daintily bounced on her toes. Is this your coffin? She asked. Eldritch simply smiled and romantically stripped the shroud into the air with one hand as he used his other to spotlight his showpiece. Lights turned on as a faint humming sound rumbled at our feet. The majesty of the professional-sized brush metal phenomenon was open for all eyes to see. As the cover fell behind him, he announced, Air Hockey. I never thought many of Eldritch's things were cool, but this was the sole reason I came to his place all the time. There was nothing better than getting wasted for free and playing ghetto hockey on his ginormous table. To prevent it from getting demolished up by our vampy power, he reinforced the frame with steel, which also fit the other furnishings in the house. Although I didn't think one way or the other about all that garbage, I loved this table. It was perfectly level and he always kept it in top shape so that the hoverability of the pucks never died out or got sticky. Disappointed, Bate turned to study a picture of Eldritch dressed as Count Cracula. I flipped my personal paddle out of my back pocket and whirled it around in front of me. Eldritch opened an old safe cloaked behind a painting of him naked and covered in blood with a bunch of white wolves. In the safe were half a dozen paddles that he tailored for his large hands. I will go with Mozart today, he announced, plucking his paddle from the safe. We played air hockey for about four hours while Bates slept upstairs on Eldritch's elephant coffin waterbed. For the record, I beat him 13 games to 12. In about the middle of the third game, he decided to hide the drugs from me and make drops for Bait to pick up. Good evening. This is Jason Hill, host of the Horror Hill podcast. You've been listening to a chapter from the award-winning novel Knuckle Supper by best-selling author Drew Stebeck. Knuckle Supper, Ultimate Gutter Fix Edition, and its critically acclaimed sequel, Knuckle Bald, are available now from Bloodbound Books. Check out the links in the video description and sticky comments below to pick up a copy today and show your support for indie horror. Also, please consider making a donation to Children of the Night today and help end teen prostitution and human trafficking. Children of the Night is a privately funded nonprofit organization established in 1979 with the specific purpose of providing intervention in the lives of children who are sexually exploited and vulnerable to, or involved in, prostitution, and pornography. Visit childrenofthenight.org for more information today. From author Drew Stepick and all of us here at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, thanks for listening and for your support. Chilling Tales.
Tales for Dark Nights.